Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Potvin, Executive Director of the Employees Retirement System of Georgia. As the guardian of your state pension, we encourage you to learn more about how to protect your finances, including how not to get scammed. Let's take a few minutes together to learn more. Dale Cardwell, better known as Trust Dale, is a six-time Emmy Award-winning journalist. He spent nearly 15 years as an investigative reporter with WSB TV and radio. Dale also hosts the consumer problem-solving and scam prevention television show, Trust Dale Investigates, which airs locally on Peachtree TV. In 2009, he created TrustDale.com, which is a free consumer research and referral website that helps people make their most important buying decisions. Dale is the best-selling author of Don't Get Scammed, Get Smart, Seven Simple Steps to Becoming a Savvy Consumer. So I hear you've done a lot of research and your mission is to, to help people. So let's begin with what is the kind of basis or elements of a scam? What causes someone to be put in a position to get swindled? I want to take you back to when you were five years old, seven years old, and you went to the county fair and you saw a carnival barker. And maybe he's at a table and he's playing this game with cards or with balls or with cups. Um, and it's a friendly atmosphere. Everybody's having fun but you're kind of being rushed and you're having to make really quick decisions. Here's what you don't know, Jim. The person that's running that game has run that game thousands of times. I call it, he has the script, you don't. He knows exactly where that ball is going to be. He knows which card is going to turn up. You don't. He fools you into believing that you're part of this game, but you've lost the minute you start playing. You commit money, you commit time, and you're going to be a victim. That's how I characterize getting taken by a scam. So, what is the ripoff range? <laughs> okay, so I characterize the ripoff range as a person who loses anything from $500 up to $50,000 in a con. The reason that works is because anything below $500, you're you're probably not going, going to complain to the police or to authorities. You just mark it up to a lesson learned. Anything over $50,000, chances are you have enough leverage in the community to get someone's attention, whether it's the court system or the police. But that middle range, $500 to $50,000, is one of the most lucrative areas of the economy for con artists, and I'll tell you why. Someone comes to your home and they sell you a product and they want cash in advance and you, you write them a check. Your check clears and then they never come back to do the work. Well, you're, you're incensed. You can't believe this has happened, so you call the police. The police come out to your home and they fill an incident report out and you're kind of happy because finally someone's going to be held accountable for this, right? Mm -hmm. And you say to the officer, so when do you expect to make an arrest? And he looks at you and says, well, there's not going to be an arrest. What? I got ripped off. Oh no, this is a civil matter. This is a business dispute. Your, your best opportunity is to take this incident report and file a claim in small claims court. No, no, I've been robbed. You're kidding me. That's the ripoff range. These con artists have, have figured out that there are three components to taking advantage of you. One is that you're going to give your money and you're not going to communicate it with your friends and neighbors because you're embarrassed that you've been taken. You don't want people to know you've been taken. Right. The second component is that they move around from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. They will rip off five families in Decatur and then they'll go to Woodstock and they'll rip off ten families there. And the reason for that is because police jurisdictions don't communicate. If there's a hotbed of criminal activity in Woodstock, the folks in Woodstock are busy. They're not going to pick up the phone and call Decatur and tell the Decatur police that this may happen to you. The third component is that the court system is going to consider that a business dispute. They're not going to consider it a crime. So you literally have thousands of con artists that operate in this ripoff range. They steal anywhere from $500 to $50,000 from well-intentioned Georgians every day. It's a billion dollar industry that frankly no one's doing anything about. And on our television show, we expose those circumstances because the best prevention, Jim, is, is to not let it happen to you and to be informed before it happens. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that don't think of 50,000 as the middle or a small claim of any kind. <laughs> um, so that's gotta be a frustrating experience for them when they can't get any 
any traction from law enforcement on this. Oh, it, it's so sad. And you're flabbergasted. You can't believe that if someone steals $40,000 from you, why, why can you not act on my behalf to try to get that back? The sad reality is that our law enforcement officials are so overwhelmed with violent crime that they simply don't have time to pursue these kinds of crimes. So they get classified as civil disputes. And as I said, people that have the ability to lose $50,000, chances are their checkbook is going to allow them to, they could have lost 100000 or 200000 And they may have an attorney uh, in their in their Rolodex, or they may know someone in the criminal justice system that's going to pursue that, a district attorney that takes interest. But when you're in that rip-off range, uh, you, it's no man's land. So I'm trying to teach people to recognize it in advance. So you say in your book that once you know how, it's pretty easy to spot a scam. So what forms can a scam take? Okay, so the first thing is that the person that wants to take advantage of you wants to make a connection. I remember one time I got a call from a guy that was soliciting money from a situation that I think was legit, but he told me he had the same last name as me. I mean, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but he created a connection. Suddenly, I feel like I should know this guy. The second thing he's going to do is he's going to associate it with something credible. He's going to use a name of an organization or something that I'm familiar with. You hear all kinds of people talking about soliciting money for kidney funds. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of, of uh, kidney funds that are illegitimate, but they use that word because there are certain legitimate kidney funds, right? The third thing they're going to do is they're going to play on your emotions. You need to help these people. Dale, you have time to do this. Take time out of your day, busy day, and make this happen for somebody. Those three elements are almost always present when someone's about to take advantage of you. Well, and we just know from our everyday lives, there's a lot of need out there, and you know, sometimes you want to be able to try to help somebody, and if they catch you at that time, then you're definitely a potential victim. Uh, the famous author Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote a book about it. He says, wouldn't it be a terrible sick situation if, if human beings were wired to distrust out of the gate? You, you're skeptical of everyone. No, we, we are wired to believe people. We want to expect the best in other people and, and that's what makes us susceptible to be taken. Yeah, we can get into trouble that way pretty yeah. easily. So what's new in the world of scams? What's oh. been coming out lately? Oh my gosh, uh, cyber scams. Mm -hmm. Everything has moved to the internet. Uh, Post-COVID, I would say that there's been a 35, 40% increase in people being taken advantage of online. From seniors who are at home and perhaps bored and they, ha they know how to use their computer but they don't know all of the tricks that can come into their computer portal, the people that are trained to take advantage of them. Uh, companies that are impersonating other companies. There was recently a big scam where a company just simply uh, took advantage of the marquee and the colorings of, of a company that we all recognize and they pretended it was them and they started advertising all these crazy online deals where you were getting something for pennies on the dollar and thousands of Americans got sucked into that because they simply believed that because they had the logo and the colors of this company that was the company. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It's, it's so easy to take advantage of people online. And, and again, we go back to the ripoff range. Law enforcement is not equipped to help all these people that are being taken advantage of online. And finally, the other problem with that, Jim, is you either can't find the con artists mm -hmm. um, or they are operating out of country. And we don't really have the legal ability to do anything to them. We often hear a little bit closer to home about contractor scams. What's your advice for new homeowners or somebody who is in need of a home repair and is out looking for some assistance? Number one, get three estimates. The number one way that people t get taken advantage of is they simply operate off of one referral. It's what their brother-in-law told them. They read it in the paper. They saw a television commercial. They believed someone making a claim that they were going to be able to deliver the product or service at the best price and the most professional level. You can't take that as gospel. You've got to get three estimates. Three really important things happen when you get three estimates from three 
competing companies. Number one is that you tell those companies they're competing for your business. Mm -hmm. A magic thing happens when you do that. The price seeks equilibrium because that first salesperson knows what that second salesperson is going to offer it for. The second thing that's going to happen, it's going to trigger an opportunity from the manufacturer. Maybe the manufacturer has a particular line of product that they're trying to sell and promote and they are giving an incentive to that salesperson to move it. Well, you may get a better deal because they suddenly realize they've got to really dig down deep and figure out what, what Jim needs and what his family needs. The third thing that you're going to do by getting three estimates is that you're going to get rid of those people that are thinking, I can make a buck off this person because he's not going to comp compare prices. I can perhaps get him to believe that he needs this part when he really doesn't need the part because that salesperson realizes someone's going to come in behind him and say, you don't need that part. Your system is perfectly fine. You just needed a, a, you know, a refresh. So that's how you protect yourself. So I'm going to follow your advice and I got three estimates and one of them comes in 50% lower than the other two. Guess I found my winner, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> oh. no. You might have found a person that's cutting corners. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not purchasing liability insurance for their business and their employees, or they perhaps uh, are operating where you're not going to find them once that they have your deposit check. Okay. Someone that's incredibly below market, I find, are generally cutting corners. I tend to like the mid middle ground. I, I rarely go for the person that, that has the most expensive estimate unless he can or she can really demonstrate to me the value, the increased value of going with them. Uh -huh. You find someone in the middle, they generally have a great product, they know how to install it or deliver it, and they're going to stand behind what they sell. Okay. So sometimes when you're dealing with these contractors or salespeople in general, they try to upsell you. So how do you protect yourself from getting these upselling sales or, or buying more than you actually need? So one thing that I try to encourage all the companies that I work with is to sell the product in a way that, that educates the consumer as to what they need. Don't try to sell them what you want them to obtain, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the really obvious flags of that happening to you is if someone comes in and you say, wow, that's a lot more than I expected to, to buy or to spend. And before they leave, they say, well, if you act today, I can cut this price by 40%. <laughs> that's a great sign that someone's coming in high and working low. Mm -hmm. I, I encourage companies to come in and find out what Jim needs. What does his family want? You might not need triple pane glass for your replacement windows. You live near an airport, maybe you need triple pane glass, but you probably only need double pane glass. So, so educate me as to what I need for the purposes that I want to use it for. And, and when I believe you're educating me, then you're going to increase your belief level with me and I'm going to trust you far more than if, if you're coming in and trying to sell me and then you start cutting the price. All right. Now in your book, you talk a lot about how emotions are an important clue. Your own emotions are an important clue in a scam. So how can people understand this about themselves and protect themselves in these situations? So lots of folks ask me, Dale, what's the 10 most common scams and what do I need to look mm -hmm. out for? I try not to do that. I don't play that game because the scammers are constantly morphing the 10 most common scams. They're moving it from a checkbook to an online account. They're, they're always figuring out a way to, to deal it to you in a way that you don't know. So what I teach people, Jim, is, is to recognize the emotional triggers of someone trying to take advantage of you. The first is, is this too good to be true, right? Is this too good to be true? Uh, is a, a tried and true way of knowing I need to take some time and, and I don't need to bite on this. I need to, I need to take time to talk to people that I trust to figure out if it's real. The second and much less talked about emotional trigger is do I feel like I'm getting over on Jim? Do I feel like I'm getting a super deal that's really going to leave him in the lurch? And in other words, do I feel greedy? Um, and that's, that's a component that is almost present in almost every scam is that I am getting over on you or I'm taking advantage of the situation. Nine times out of ten, you're the one that winds up getting taken advantage of. 
And at the end of the day, it's hard to get anybody to feel sorry for you, especially in law enforcement or the courts, right. because they realize that there was an element of greed in play. And they say, you got what you deserved. So if I'm getting myself into a situation and I realize that I may be on the cusp of falling victim to a scam, what's your advice for me in that situation? Stop. <laughs> Just stop. Get up and walk out. This is one of the, the tools that con artists use. They play on your emotions because they know that you want to believe that it's real. You don't want to offend them. You, you want to believe that they are treating you with respect and dignity. Again, they have the script, Jim. You don't. So if you're buying a car and suddenly you have agreed to a price but before you sign the paper they say and there's this documentation fee that's going to be seven hundred and fifty dollars well it's so hard to do it but at that point you need to stand up and you need to excuse yourself because if someone's presenting a variable at the very end of the deal that's a substantial expense they've been planning that the whole time and you need to recognize that you're getting played as difficult as it is to want to believe you're not that's a surefire sign that you're getting taken advantage of but I really like that car Dale <laughs> <laughs> yeah I understand <laughs> so why is financial planning important Oh, goodness, goodness. Because you want to protect your spouse, you want to protect your family, you want to protect your legacy. You know, um, there are so many products and services on the market that claim to, to safeguard your retirement. Uh, I say it's just, it's just five simple letters, and I call it ITHL, right? You, okay. you need to have an income plan, because when you retire, you still need income, right? Mm -hmm. Only after you have an income plan, you need an investment plan. You can't invest money if you don't have income, right? So you need an income plan, you need an investment plan, then you need a tax plan because Uncle Sam's always going to be there. Right. Uncle Sam doesn't go away just because you've <laughs> retired, right? right? So make certain that you're ready for the tax changes that come when you decide to, to stop working actively uh, for an employer or for yourself. And then you need a health care plan because everyone has to deal with changes in uh, their life, and with their spouse, with their family. And then finally, you've made it, everybody's happy, you've got this income that's going to sustain you for the rest of your life, but what about your kids? What about legacy? What do I want to happen to the income that I worked so hard? If you're talking to a financial planner, if they are not hitting those five points, there's a problem. If they're focusing on only one of the five points, like an, in, like an investment plan, but they're not talking about income and they're not talking about taxes, that's a, that's a concern. So make sure you have balance in that portfolio. Really one of the themes of your book is being planful regardless of the situation, right? So you're talking about big picture here, but also just on a transactional basis, right? Know what you want get the estimates, do your, do your homework, essentially. Right? I think you read my book, Jim. I did. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I call it uh, product offer price. Uh, you want to define the elements of a deal. And the way you do that is, is define that element by uh, looking for the product that you want. Uh, that takes proactive action. You, you want to test drive that car to see if it does and delivers the variables that you need it to do. If you want a vacuum cleaner, go to the store, look at the vacuum cleaner, borrow your neighbors and see if it does, because you don't need a vacuum cleaner that does 10 things that you don't need it to do, and that becomes more expensive. So once you know the elements of what you need out of that product or service, then you entertain offers. And, and you're not going to get a shortage of people that are going to offer you and when they know that, that they're competing for your business, they're going to bring that magical price down to equilibrium point. That's how you arrive at a fair price. When you have good American competition for your dollar, that's how you know that you're getting a fair price at the end of the day. So Dale's a final thought. I've got a couple of college age children. What, what advice would you give to them or to your kids? Save. <laughs> Save. If you have access to a 401k, you know, my son is uh, 35 okay. and he started saving a lot sooner than I did. Mm -hmm. I, you know, back when I started out, I never had enough money, Jim, to put, <laughs> to put away, right? right. Um, yeah. And I, I really, really have hammered to him and to my daughter that even if it's 
5% of your check, put it in savings, put it in a 401k because as you well know, that compound interest is going to come back and take care of you many years down the road. If I could impart one piece of advice to my kids and, and to answer your question, what do I tell everyone's kids that's watching this is encourage them to save and don't do everything for them. Warren Buffett says, I want to leave enough money to my kids that they can do anything they want to, but I don't want to leave so much they don't have to do anything. <laughs> oh, makes sense. They have so many competing priorities though, right? They might have loans from school, they might need a new car, they want to save for their first house, a wedding, whatever it is. Um, it's hard to decide what to prioritize. Invest in things that you get a return on because cars and clothes, you don't get return on those. And so try to focus on the things that, are, that you can sell or that uh, you can at least retain some value. So Dale, we really appreciate your time to help educate our Georgia State employees. Um, how can people learn more about you and the Trust Dale message? Oh, it's really easy. Um, just log on to trustdale.com and you will find all the things that I talk about and you know, Fast Funds Found and, and D-E-A-L, the, the seven steps to becoming a savvy consumer. And you know, watch our television show, uh, Trust Dale Investigates, which airs uh, Saturdays on Peachtree TV. Well, thank you again. Uh, and to learn more about your state retirement benefits, please visit ers.ga.gov. Thanks for joining us.